Good evening uh, and welcome everyone to this virtual Board of Visitors meeting on this very snowy evening here in Massachusetts. I'm Corin Petro. I'm the co-chair of Fenway's Board of Visitors and we're thrilled you all could join us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging and at times painful circumstances under which we're meeting here this evening. This year has been a difficult one. The COVID-19 pandemic has killed hundreds of thousands across the country, infected millions more, and has left countless others struggling economically and without vital access to health care or health insurance. We are also living in a time of great social unrest as we face an important reckoning over racial injustice amidst one of the most politically divisive moments in our history. During such a difficult time, it can be easy to feel powerless. It's important to remember, however, that moments like these can also be transformative, which is exactly why we're gathered here tonight. Fenway Health has been at the forefront of LGBTQIA plus healthcare for nearly 50 years, amassing a wealth of experience and expertise through patient care, treatment, and research during this time. When faced with the emergence of the coronavirus, Fenway took that knowledge and applied it in all new ways to help our communities com combat the spread of COVID-19. Tonight, our guest speakers, Janet Mulligan, Adriana Bulan, Chris Grasso, and Alex Gonzalez will take us through some of the transformations Fenway has undergone to face the challenges 2020 has presented and how those ch changes will shape the next chapter of Fenway Health. I wanna thank you all again for being here tonight and for your commitment to enduring equitable access to healthcare for all. To begin our conversation this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Fenway Health CEO, Ellen LaPointe. Thank you, thank you, Corbin. And uh, hello to all of you, good evening uh, and welcome. I actually wanna begin uh, my remarks tonight with, um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, um, uh, as many of you know, land acknowledgements are really simple and powerful ways to show respect to uh, the original occupants of the land uh, that we occupy. And it's actually a meaningful step towards honoring truth and making invisible things visible and uh, the step towards correcting American stories that have erased indigenous people's tribal history and culture. So I wanna first say that Fenway Health is situated on land that is uh, the territory of the Massachusetts people and their neighbors, uh, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples as well. Um, we at Fenway Health have the privilege of doing our work as an ongoing beneficiary of colonial practices that have included forced removal and genocide of indigenous people who cared for this land. Um, so you know, I, we feel that in order to conscionably celebrate Fenway Health's extraordinary legacy and history of pioneering healthcare as a right and not a privilege, we really have to first honor and respect the very, uh, the, the many diverse indigenous peoples who are still connected to this same land on which we currently champion this fight. So let me begin with that. I do wanna thank all of you uh, as Corbin just did for joining all of us during a time in which we're experiencing extraordinary demands on our attention. Uh, and when, frankly, one more Zoom meeting uh, at the end of a long day can maybe feel like climbing several flights of stairs, perhaps. Um, but I really am uh, confident that you are going to find the next hour to be quite inspiring and well worth your time. So I hope you have uh, are cozy and warm and safe tonight on this evening. Um, and I do invite you to grab a beverage of your choosing and just settle in for what I think you'll find to be a terrific hour of conversation. So. I do wanna welcome all of you, uh, Board of Visitors members, uh, Board of Visitors Court Chairs, uh, Corbin Petro and Ryan Gosser here on screen. Um, I wanna uh, welcome young leaders, council members and YLC Steering Committee Co-Chairs, Ali Robinson and Jillian Comito who are here with us tonight. Um, this is the first time uh, YLC members who uh, give over a certain threshold are, have been invited to this meeting and we're really happy that you're here. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank all of the members of the Fenway Health Board of Directors who have joined us uh, this evening. And of course, I do want to extend uh, deep appreciation to our, uh, all of our leadership donors, our legacy society members and our corporate sponsors who are here as well. So yeah, you know, to say uh, there are no words for the year that we've had is pretty much a cliche at this point. And, and uh, you know, let's just state the obvious, shall we? There has really, this has been like no other year in our lifetimes. Um, then there have been enormous challenges and triumphs. Uh, these include, of course, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, also the infusion of energy and uh, urgency into the way that we are reckoning with the legacy of systemic racism and white supremacy in our country, 
uh, that followed the murder of George Floyd um, in, in uh, late May. And then of course, the results of the presidential election, which have just come. Um, Michelle Obama reminds us uh, that history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. I love that, also her. Um, you know, then we help has a rich legacy of rising to challenges and responding effectively to the benefits, uh, to benefit our patients and our communities. And while there certainly is no question that we're living through incredibly tough times, um, I really am here to tell you that uh, we have indeed risen to these challenges with great courage and there really are reasons for hope. You know, we've, we've forged durable pathways and approaches uh, that are gonna serve us uh, for the long term, including uh, the adaptations that we've made in response to COVID-19, um, our deeply intentional efforts to transform ourselves into an organization that centers racial equity and is explicitly anti-racist, uh, and the recent launch of a, of a strategic planning process that's going to inform our goals and priorities over the next three to five years. My colleagues are going to tell you more about uh, how the playbook we developed to fight AIDS was utilized to great effect, actually, to develop safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. This really is quite a week to be gathering, isn't it? Even today, uh, with news coming just a couple of hours ago. Um, and we'll talk about how we intend to engage in getting vaccines to people in our community in the coming months. The election of uh, Joe Biden pretends a return to policies designed to protect rather than harm and undermine LGBTQIA plus people. Um, and ensure that we have access to care and treatment that we deserve and need. Um, but that work is going to take some um, effort. Um, and we, of course, are delighted that Fenway Health will be celebrating uh, 50 years in 2021 with a year long series of events to mark uh, the anniversary of our founding. So uh, watch this space, as Rachel Maddow would say. Um, more to come there, to be sure. So I am I'm truly optimistic about the outlook for Fenway Health and for all that we do with and for uh, the communities who count on us. Um, I'm gonna stop talking now. I'm extremely honored, genuinely uh, honored uh, and delighted to introduce you to our panelists this evening. These are my wonderful colleagues, people with whom I get to work every day and from whom I learn something every day, all the time. Um, they're going to be talking um, at much greater length about some of the things uh, I've just mentioned um, and how we are trying to shape the future um, of Fenway Health uh, and, the, and, and everything that we have to offer. So uh, first, our executive director um, of nursing, Janet Mulligan, is going to be talking about our testing initiatives. Uh, our, uh, the community engagement manager of the Fenway Institute, Adriana Bulin, will be talking about how we're engaging diverse communities in our, our research and um, in uh, a whole host of very important um, initiatives that are just underway. Our Associate Vice President for Informatics and Data Services, Chris Grasso, is going to talk uh, more with you about how we have really pivoted to telehealth and what uh, we think a potent tool that is going to uh, continue to be for the foreseeable future and what the, a lot of really interesting opportunities that are coming through that uh, technology advancement. And then our medical director, Alex Gonzalez, is going to uh, reflect on sort of the impacts on patient care and, and the impending efforts um, that we are beginning to develop to uh, distribute approved COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, I'll stop there, um, hand it off to you, Janet Mulligan. And again, just to, to all of you, I just want to uh, express my deep appreciation and thanks for being here tonight. I hope you enjoy and uh, learn a great deal. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I'm going to talk to you all about our COVID testing journey, um, which has been um, somewhat of a challenge. Um, the challenge being that um, Fenway, Fenway's foot doesn't hold a lot of room outdoors for us to do testing, unlike many of our sister organizations organizations that have parking lots and outdoor areas where they can hold testing. And it was very important, still is very important that the testing be done outdoors for the protection of our staff and of patients so that any spray of um, potential infection infected patients stay outdoors. Um, so we started with partnering with um, our local um, Boston Public, uh, um, Boston Public School System, the McKinley School right in our backyard. Um, they had a big open parking lot, you all know, was shut down. 
down. Um, and we built what became well known to many of us as the, the Taj Mahal of testing. Um, we were able to build a testing tent that not only could serve patients that could drive through, um, but also patients that could walk up. So we had a walk up portion of our tent, and then we had a drive through patient. Um, and we were able to serve about 100 patients per day. To date, we've served um, and tested over 11,000 patients. Our staff were in appropriate PPE. We were able to secure PPE from the get-go. Um, again, many of our colleagues and other organizations were not so lucky, um, but we were and had great relationships with our distributors to be able to get um, what we needed in terms of um, masks and visors and jumpsuits, et cetera. Um, our tent has been staffed MDs, nurse practitioners, nurses, medical assistants, and dental assistants. And <clears throat> the entire organization really rallied to all of everybody that was doing the testing because we knew it was important work. So this was the, the thank you heart wall in our cafeteria that looked over the um, testing tent to say thank you to everybody that was out there day in and day out, especially during the summer when it got quite, quite hot. And under all that PPE, it was not easy work. This is a, a view of the inside of the tent where we had all of our um, supplies um, and uh, computer, printer, et cetera, um, and tried to keep everything at a distance so that everybody stayed safe. Again, if the patients were driving through, it was right through this area, and the walk up was over here at this area. Um, the staff, I have to say, that worked and, uh, and um, provided um, support for this really felt very strongly that they were part of the solution to the COVID-19 um, pandemic and that um, never complained once. In fact, they were thrilled to be part of it um, and um, did a beautiful job every single day. In August of this past year, the school had to evict us from our space because school was coming back into session. So again, we searched um, with our partners in the neighborhood and the Trinity Church that was a few blocks down told us that we could use their parking lot. They were not as um, open to us building another Taj Mahal because they didn't want uh, spikes in the ground, et cetera. But they did allow us to put up these pop-up tents that we would put up in the morning and take down in the afternoon. Um, this didn't afford us the opportunity to have drive up, but people could drive in, park and walk up and get tested. And again, it kept us um, at the opportunity to be able to do about a hundred tests for people on a daily basis. And still, no matter how hard it get, got, people were, people, the staff were thrilled to be able to do it for our patients and our staff that needed testing. And then the weather started to change as we saw today. Um, and the, trying to test outside in the bitter cold under a pop-up tent was no longer feasible. So we have a temporary site right now, right out front um, by our front door. Um, and this is it. Um, it's a small tent in which the patient comes, they call so, to tell us that they're there. They sit in this chair, a staff member comes out of the side door, will test the patient and then um, process the sample, leave it in a cooler, and then the next patient will come. Unfortunately, we can't test as many patients as we could when we could do um, two chairs or four chairs at a time, but we can at least do patients that are symptomatic or have been um, exposed. So we are staying um, up with those that really need it. But, but hope, is, um, hope is in the wings um, because we do have a plan for how to make this better for our patients and our staff. What we're hoping to do is purchase these pods, which we will be putting in our dining room, um, that are negative pressure pods that patients can walk into, 
the staff would be on the opposite side. They'll still be in PPE. We'll be able to test them. All of any um, COVID um, bacteria or virus will be pulled out and aired out to the outside. Um, and we'll have two of these. So again, we'll be able to get up to doing 100 tests on a daily basis. Um, we're, we're hoping to have these on site on um, up and running within three and a half weeks. Um, and then long term plans that's going to take a bit longer and maybe a pipe dream of mine, but we're hoping maybe to get a mobile health van. And this mobile health van, we could not only do COVID testing, and hopefully we won't have to do COVID testing forever, but it could be changed into a mobile health clinic where we could actually bring health care to the people that need it the most, that may not be able to get to us, but we could get to them. And we could do testing like HIV testing, Hep C testing, STI testing, et cetera. So this is our, our long, long-term plan. Um, for testing and care for our patients. So that's been our COVID testing experience to date. Um, now I'm going to stop sharing and I'd like to introduce Adriana. Thank you, Janet, and thank you. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us all. I'm excited to chat with you a little bit about how we've transformed our research practices to being more inclusive and representative of our whole collective community. Uh, I'm going to start with a few questions just to get started with us. And I invite you to reflect on these questions to yourself, but you can also type them in the chat if you'd like. And the first is, what motivates you? What motivates you? And for the purpose of time, I'll go fast, but would definitely encourage you all to reflect on these questions. The next is, when was the last time you felt empowered and what empowered you? And I do see that folks are typing in the chat, which I'm really happy for. I'm seeing equity and justice, keep it coming, thank you. And the last question, what makes you feel a part of something? What makes you feel a part of something? Thank you all for your contributions in the chat. We're going to stop sharing for a moment because I want you to be able to see my face as we're speaking for a moment. This is such a transformational time in history and it's an honor for us here at Fenway to be a part of the world's effort in developing an effective vaccine for COVID-19. And as the leading medical institution in enhancing the well-being and overall health for LGBTQIA plus people, both locally and nationally for decades, we've established a strong and growing relationship with the LGBTQIA plus community as one of the communities at greatest risk for HIV. And I, I think it's so beautiful that just as we were and continue to be on the front lines of HIV AIDS prevention and treatment work, we now join in with the world to end the pandemic. Beginning coronavirus prevention research here at the Fenway Institute has given us the opportunity to expand our reach and build our partnerships beyond the LGBTQIA plus community. And since April of this year, we've expanded um, our focus of uh, by identifying ways to engage, educate, and increase representation of populations and research that we hadn't and as intentionally before, either because of the scope of our research protocols and their deliverables. You know, increased representation is important so that what's developed is developed with everybody's body in mind. And what we found um, since April of this year in engaging um, with different communities that there exists a lot of barriers to engaging communities in this research, especially Black and Indigenous people of color, um, one of the most vulnerable populations for COVID-19. And these barriers um, of acceptability of a vaccine um, that we've observed over these past nine months and in intentionally engaging with them um, is distrust in medical infrastructure and distrust in how communities engage. Um, 
when I say intentionally engaging, I mean engaging in ways that will best serve them and in turn serve and progress our collective goals. And so from our experiences um, in engaging around COVID-19 prevention, we've developed this best practice slash series of guiding questions that has really helped us support intentional and ongoing engagement that I'll share with you all. So first, who are we trying to connect with? Who are they? And what do we know about them? And once we've identified that, why do we wanna engage them? And what do we wanna engage them in? Really thinking through each of these different pieces before moving forward. And then thinking about who else has trusting relationships with this group that we're trying to connect with and how has those perspectives been added to the way that we're connecting with this community. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, what are the current barriers, but more importantly, what tools exist that may help us overcome these barriers? And one of my most favorite questions is, what's the population's greatest need and how does that fit into what you want to engage them in? And so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And to speak a little bit more about the greatest need, you know, as an example, when I'm out in the community and I'm working with different people and talking about our research, you know, it's not as easy as giving someone a flyer and saying, here's this flyer, I'll tell you a little bit our research, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. If in meeting someone, we learn that their greatest need in that moment is mental health services, which during this time, there's a great need for many people, providing them with information about how to access services so that they can themselves be whole and remaining open for them may until they're ready to engage with us. That's how that's success for us, being able to support them in their greatest need and then still being there for them to engage with us after. I wanna go back to the slides really quickly to share an awesome article that was just, um, that was just published. Um, and one of our co-authors is our very own um, Dr. Ken Mayer. And it talks about authentic community investment. Um, and it says in the paper that meaningful community investment um, is to acknowledge the need for capacity building that would lead to more equal partnerships in defining and achieving shared priorities, such as ensuring the uptake of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. Investment strategies would contribute to the establishment of partnerships between communities of color, industry, academia, and the government that builds on assets in each entity and ensure mutual and bi-directional. Well, and a way that I wanted to show how we've exercised this here at Fenway Health and the Fenway Institute is with the Boston Black COVID-19 Coalition. The Boston Black COVID-19 Coalition is a group that was founded in March of this year. Um, and they're made of stakeholders and thought leaders all around Boston who've come together to collaborate and share information resources and maintain accountability for the response recovery and ongoing collective action during and after COVID-19. Our interaction started with the group in about August of this year. And initially it was to spread awareness of the research activities that we were doing around COVID-19 prevention and, and increase representation in that work. Because as I mentioned, it's important for everyone to be involved in that work. And from that initial engagement, it showed us that we had such an opportunity to and should first explore with the BBCC building a better practice of bi-directional engagement with community partners. And, it's been a great process over the past couple of months to explore that with the group. And it's great to have that time to do that um, during this time. And I'd like to now pass it to Chris Grasso. Great, thank you, Adriana. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. Okay, let's start from the top here. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Grasso, and I'm the Vice President for Informatics and Data at Fenway. Um, and I have the pleasure to talk with you tonight about our telehealth program at Fenway. Um, so just to set the stage for you, sort of prior to COVID, um, you know, Fenway, like many places across the uh, country, were interested in implementing telehealth programs, but there were a number of barriers. Uh, so a couple of the key ones were 
um, licensure requirements. So for example, if you were licensed in Massachusetts as a clinician um, and a patient was located in New Hampshire, you couldn't see that patient because they were across state lines. Um, there was also null parity, uh, meaning that if we provided a service to a patient, we would not get reimbursed for that. Um, and lastly, there were just uh, exorbitant software and technology costs that were, um, that were really hard to um, um, overcome at points in time. But COVID really hit the fast forward button on telehealth. Um, and I'm really excited to talk with you today about what we accomplished at Fenway over the last nine months. This is actually one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, visuals to really talk about our quick pivot to telehealth. Um, and this is describing our visit and our visit volume really over the last nine months. And so the blue color you see here represents our in-person visits. The orange represents our, a number of our phone visits and the red color represents our video visits. And so early on in March, um, you know, we began, began discussing um, what we needed to do in order to keep our patients and our staff safe. And so um, or that second week of March, which is that second um, blue uh, uh, row you see there, um, is where we really began talking about making that pivot to telehealth. And so on Friday, March 13th, we made that decision um, and decided that we needed to implement our telehealth program for the safety of our, our patients and our staff. And within days, really literally days, the following week, um, that Friday, we had uh, transitioned about 87% of our vi visits to, to phone, um, which is really remarkable. Um, and you know, this really could not be done without a lot of teamwork at Fenway. And what's really most impressive about this is that a typical telehealth program would really take months, even a year to get up and running, but we really did this in a matter of days. I mean, at Fenway, you know, we felt like it was important to really take this one step further. So we didn't stop with just using phones. Um, we decided that we also needed to implement video visits as well. You know, we sort of felt like from a pers perspective of both our patients and our staff that um, this would really improve the quality of care that we could provide. Um, so for example, uh, you know, uh, if a patient had a rash, it would be pretty hard to see that over the phone, but if you were doing a video visit, a provider could see that rash and evaluate it. Um, or even, you know, having a view into a patient's world. Um, you, we know that where people live um, can greatly impact their health outcomes, so it allows a, pro a provider to see that window. Um, you could also have conversations around medication. You could ask the patient to get their pill bottles, show me what you're taking, show me how many pills you have left, are you adhering to your medication? Um, it was really um, a phenomenal um, experience um, as part of an organization and being a part of this pr process to make that pivot to telehealth. Um, one of the things that really, I, when I think about this experience that I'm most proud of and I think about the 18 years that I've been at Fenway, uh, this pivot to telehealth was, was really at the top of them. It couldn't have happened without incredible teamwork and collaboration across this entire organization. It wasn't just one person. It wasn't just one, one department that made this happen. Um, we had the support of our clinical departments, our patient registration staff, our informatics, our data staff, our IT staff, our finance staff, uh, compliance, grants. Um, everybody came together to make this happen. Um, and over the last nine months, we've been able to provide uh, over 85,000 visits to patients via telehealth and care for more than 24,000 unduplicated patients, which is really phenomenal. And a couple of the areas um, that I you know, really wanted to highlight as well is you know, some of the communities that maybe we've had challenges in providing services to the past, but um, through telehealth, we've been able to break through some of those barriers. For example, our BIPOC patients. Um, we see more BIPOC patients utilizing our telehealth services than they did our in-person services. So we feel really hopeful about the opportunity that telehealth can provide in uh, reaching communities that maybe we haven't always done such a good job at, um, and, and also addressing some of, those, um, some of those people with intersecting identities. And we were also able to pivot some very important services to telehealth as well. Um, a great example of that is our behavioral health walk-in services. Uh, you know, we uh, basically, uh, prior to COVID, patients can show up at one of our clinic locations and access uh, behavioral health services during walk-in hours without an appointment. And we knew that it was critical co to continue those services, especially during COVID. And so we quickly were able to pivot those services to, to a virtual environment so patients could access these virtual walk-in visits um, through a Zoom link. And you know, at a time during COVID, um, you know, people are already feeling very challenged and um, they could already, it could already intensify some of the feelings that people are having, or maybe people weren't feeling 
or now suddenly feeling you know, depressed or isolated as a result of COVID. So, so being able to provide these types of services during this period of time was critically important. Um, and another uh, you know, great example of this uh, is really the, the breadth of where people came from. Uh, this graphic is obviously a uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts and it's specifically looking at patients who identify sexual and gender minorities. And each of these sort of dots represents um, one patient. And you can see that while people are predominantly uh, located around the greater Boston area, but you could see people coming and using telehealth services from Western Mass, from the North Shore, from the South Shore. So this really opens up the opportunity for us to care for people all across the Commonwealth and really sort of remove some of those barriers that people were facing previously um, to accessing care. But to me, that's not the most exciting part of telehealth. Um, the most exciting, one of the most exciting things that I've seen is the utilization of patients from across the country. So when I was looking at these data um, after the first few months of providing telehealth, we saw patients um, from about 24 states utilizing uh, telehealth services at Fenway. And that's since expanded. Um, when I looked at this most, more recently, we saw patients come from 38 states around the country um, util utilizing our telehealth services. Um, and this to me is a, one of the real major stories here. Um, and we think about the opportunity that this really presents, um, not just in the Commonwealth or not even New England for that matter, but really across the entire country. Um, you think of that person in Idaho or South Dakota, they can now access gender affirming care. They can now ac access culturally responsive care. This is life changing for people. Um, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to really continue this work. Um, you know, my vision for the telehealth program at Fenway and or our vision is really about creating a program as I like to refer to it as Fenway without walls. Um, it's really about having an opportunity, uh, creating, reducing those barriers, um, you know, allowing people to be visible in healthcare who really didn't have that opportunity previously. You know, we think at the federal level, we're gonna see, uh, you know, some of this uh, changes in, in um, uh, parity laws so that we'll continue to get reimbursed for telehealth services. You know, we think they'll continue to relax some of these regulations um, so that providers can continue to see patients all across the country. Um, and in fact, uh, Seema Verma, who's the CMS administrator, said the genie's out of the bottle with telehealth. And so, you know, we're really excited about the future of telehealth. And, um, you know, I think Mother Nature actually gave us a really great use case today as to why telehealth is so critical and why we see telehealth um, continuing beyond this pandemic. Uh, yesterday, we were able to convert a lot of our, our in-person visits to telehealth today. Um, and so, you know, we really see this as um, creating a virtual health system. It's really about, um, you know, using technology and, and using data analytics to meet people where they are. It's about creating a, a virtual health uh, waiting room for patients so that when you show up to your telehealth visit, you see messaging that's tailored to you and your particular needs so that you get one set of messaging and another patient gets another set of messaging depending on the healthcare needs. You know, we see the opportunity to use artificial intelligence to see um, which patients might be better served by telehealth versus in-person and then sort of guide them in one direction or another. Um, it's really the sky's the limit here and we're really excited about what the future holds for telehealth and we see this as something that we'll just continue to provide. Um, we're weaving this into our strategic plan, not as a standalone goal, but as something that's gonna support um, all, all of our goals um, as, we deliver, uh, as we deliver care to our patients. And so, as I put here, we really see telehealth as delivering the right care at the right time, no matter where the patient lives. Um, and speaking of care, um, I'm gonna turn that over to our uh, medical director, Dr. Alex Gonzalez, who can talk about the care that we provide at Fenway. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Chris, that was really amazing. Um, and thank you, Adriana and Janet for, for Chris. Uh, it makes me really proud to work uh, at Fenway after hearing each of you uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, about your respective realms. It also makes me really proud to see that on a, on a horrible snow day, so many people who are fans of Fenway can actually make it out um, to, to this event and wanna hear more about the work that we do. It's, I think it, it's really easy to be passionate uh, and have a purpose about uh, our mission. Um, knowing that we have folks like you out in the community uh, who are supportive of it. So I'm going to share my screen now. All right, and I want a thumbs up if folks can hear can see my slides. Okay, great. So I'm just going to run through um, 
how, co how Fenway has responded uh, to COVID um, in the last year. Um, but, you know, the unfortunate thing is that we are not just in the thick of it, we are in the worst of it, right? Um, and we can't really begin to talk about our response without first giving uh, some space and a moment to what's going on uh, both in the US and in Massachusetts and in Boston um, with respect to the pandemic. We have had almost 17 million cases of COVID diagnosed um, in this country since January. We're averaging about 1 million new cases a week. We've had over 300,000 people die of COVID since January, and we're averaging now about 3,000 deaths a day. It is staggering. In Massachusetts, the number of cases has never been higher. So even though I'm sure that we can all remember back to March, April, just the amount of fear and terror that we all felt because we did not know what exactly we were dealing with. Um, I, I hope for all of our sakes, right, that that that, that fear and terror um, has been met with resolve and confidence, but not complacency. As you can see, the number of cases is extremely high in the state right now. And I wish you all um, caution and safety and, um, and, and continued access to great care providers. I know many of you are Fenway patients. So um, I, I know that you can continue to count on us. <clears throat> the glimmer of hope around what's going on with the pandemic right now is that even though hospitalizations are going up, they're nowhere near as high as they were in the spring. They are continuing to rise though. Um, and the most hopeful um, data point is that the number of deaths is far lower than it was uh, back in the spring. But we have the you know, the, the later December holidays still ahead of us. And um, we really need to exercise caution and make sure that restrictions and, um, you know, all of the very basic, very simple, but very effective things that um, everyone has been reminding everyone to, to take uh, precautions with continue uh, for the foreseeable future because the reality is that even though vaccinations are coming, you know, for most of the general public, those vaccinations are still several months away. Uh, in Boston, infections are on the rise, um, but thankfully, you know, we live in a city with wonderful healthcare infrastructure, um, despite, you know, all of the challenges that any city has. Uh, we've been able to keep the number of deaths uh, down, even though hospitalizations are continuing to climb and cases are continuing to climb. I want to remind folks that uh, the governor announced um, the lockdown and the state of emergency in late March. Between late March and um, mid-May, there was a, lo a lockdown state in place and then beginning in mid-May, the COVID-19 reopening response began. We are now in phase three. We've been in phase three since July. We will stay in phase three until uh, we achieve herd immunity via um, immunizations or you know, some other technological advance uh, like improved biologics um, really come into play and assist with further prevention and mitigation of infection. I want to point out uh, that the state from the get-go has highlighted, as you can see here from the uh, top three rows on this table, that primary care uh, is essential to keeping populations safe. And with the exception of phase one, where only high priority primary care uh, was allowed to be practiced um, in person. And by that, we mean, you know, like at Fenway, for example, folks with STDs that needed urgent treatment, uh, folks needing medication assisted treatment of their uh, substance use disorder. Um, 
those were examples of kind of high priority primary care visits uh, that we continued throughout the pandemic. Um, and in phase two and in phase three, we you know, rolled out even more services in person as uh, I'll show you soon. So we didn't just kind of figure out what to do ourselves. Um, there are lots of agencies um, and organizations that we can rely on to guide us. And we're very, very grateful to all of them. If there's one that I could mention specifically, it would be um, Beth, the Beth Israel Leahy um, network uh, of which we are a part and who, um, you know, specifically Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center who have been an incredible partner um, throughout, throughout this process for us. Um, from you know, continuing to see our patients um, early on in the pandemic when we were not doing a lot of in-person care um, in their urgent care centers, in the emergency rooms, in their special symptom clinics, to um, assisting us with getting testing off the ground, to uh, continuing to provide excellent care to our patients who need specialty care, surgeries, inpatient care, um, they have really been an incredible partner and we're grateful to them. But we're grateful to all of our partners, uh, both you know, national, um, state and local, um, who, who have really given us a lot of great guidance and continue to do so. The, um, the fundamentals of COVID response at Fenway really rest with two different groups. We've got the ICMT, which is the Incident Command Management Team, which Ellen called um, um, around the time of the lockdown beginning. Uh, the ICMT consists of her and clinical and non-clinical leaders throughout the organization. We were meeting every day at first, um, and uh, then we started meeting a few times a week, and now we meet about once every one to two weeks. And we, you know, at, the agenda has changed over time, but uh, at first we were talking about, you know, how can we be aware of the situation, prioritize our resources, uh, stay afloat financially, uh, keep our workforce healthy and, um, and positive. And, and now, you know, I think we've transitioned more to kind of focusing on other new solutions, right? That we're called to kind of work on, including um, standing up our own symptom clinic, um, uh, continuing to expand testing since that is a linchpin of getting through this pandemic. And then finally, thankfully, uh, talking about vaccination efforts. The CCLT is a second group that has been meeting regularly and that's the COVID-19 clinical leadership team. Uh, you've already met one of the members, my colleague, uh, Janet, who's the, our executive director of nursing. We also have an ID director, Dr. Ami Multani, um, and a site medical director of Fenway South End, Ethan Brackett. And we've met pretty much daily um, since, since the beginning of the lockdown to just make sure that the clinical response in particular um, is, uh, is, is an effective one. So this is a quick timeline of, of how we've responded to COVID over the last uh, nine months. Uh, so, you know, be, I don't know if anybody remembers what they did between March 25th and May 18th. It was, it has, it was such a blur just, trying to uh, really drink from a fire hose and get as much information about this infection as possible so that can, we can really start to, um, to build an army and build a battle plan that would get us through this. Um, shortly thereafter, phase one started and we continued you know, our, our efforts to transition to telehealth. This included sourcing technology so that, um, so that providers and other staff who were working primarily from home could be as effective and as productive um, at home as they, as they would be in the workplace. Um, I have to say that our MVPs for phase one, they're not just our wonderful staff, but our amazing patients. Fenway's patients adopted telehealth at a rate that no other community health center in Massachusetts has seen. Um, we are so lucky uh, that they have been so willing to work with us in this endeavor. And I think it has, um, I think that, that you can attribute that willingness to adapt to telehealth. Um, you can attribute our, our uh, very good survival rates for COVID um, and our continued success with kind of making sure that we meet certain primary care 
uh, key performance indicators uh, because we're able to do so much of it, you know, over the phone or online. In phase two, we really started to focus more on reopening some of the in-person work, uh, not just in the medical department, um, but also uh, in, our, in our public health programs, the drug user health program, the sexual health program. And in phase three, which we're still in, we've been in phase three for about four to five months now, we finally reopened optometry and dental, um, the latter of which required significant redesign um, of our workspaces uh, both with respect to HVAC solutions and other infection control tools. Um, and uh, I, I could not be prouder of the work that our operations and facilities staff did in combination with uh, clinical leaders in those departments, optometry and dental. Uh, you'll notice that behavioral health is not listed anywhere on here. And that's because they transitioned mo more effectively than any other department uh, without, without really missing a step. Uh, they were able to keep their behavioral health volumes very high um, using a telehealth format uh, from the get-go. And Chris spent a lot of time showing you this data, and I just actually want to highlight the numbers on the top right-hand corner, which show the percentage of volume over the last seven days um, as um, as it relates to the amount of volume that we had in January before the pandemic started. So you can see by looking at the numbers on the top right hand corner, all of our clinical departments are actually more productive, busier today than they were in January before the uh, pandemic started. And the, our nurses take the cake, uh, even though only a third of our volume is in person in the medical department, um, they have been able to you know, increase their availability to patients needing things like hormone injections for transgender patients, um, STD treatments, because guess what? People are still having, having risky sex. Um, and now, uh, given that flu season is upon us, being available for influenza vaccination. So moving forward, you know, the focus is going to continue to be keeping patients safe um, by preventing coronavirus infection, but also keeping them healthy by not delaying the much needed care that they may need. We're continuing to leverage um, telehealth and we have something called a telefirst model in the medical department where we try to get as many visits as possible taken care of um, virtually. And then if people absolutely need an in-person visit, we'll get them in as soon as possible uh, for that in-person visit. We're continuing to look at, you know, how in-person work can be, uh, can continue to be safe. Uh, all the while, um, as we uh, ramp up uh, the work that we're doing in person, so that more people can get their pap smears, more people can get their preventive care, more people can get their diabetes um, and other chronic medical problems taken care of. And we have a strategic plan and the pandemic hasn't gotten in the way of that. Those are the pillars of our strategic plan, access, health equity, patient centeredness, population health and team-based care. And we continue to be devoted to these. Last but not least, this email came to us uh, about two days ago. And I'm pretty, pretty sure that my colleague Janet was uh, jumping for joy and, uh, and, and crying tears of joy when she got it because it was a, um, confirmation from the Department of Public Health that our uh, pre-order of Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, which we need in order to vaccinate our staff, um, has been approved. So just so you know, the Moderna uh, COVID-19 vaccine is one of four vaccines uh, being tested here in the U.S. And it will likely receive its emergency use authorization, its EUA, tomorrow. And that means that probably as soon as next week, we will start vaccinating our staff. We are working closely with the Department of Public Health to follow uh, the phased approach to vaccination uh, that they are guiding all healthcare facilities to follow. And we will be following up our staff vaccination efforts with a community vaccination effort uh, for our patients 
And, you know, if DPH guides us further um, for, you know, communities um, that are adjacent to us. That's all I have to say. And I think we're going to go to questions. Um, who wants to take that? Great. Thanks. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining us this evening. Um, it's exciting to see such innovation at work at Fenway Health. Uh, I'm Ryan Gosser, co-chair of the Board of Visitors with Corbin. Uh, before I close out this evening's remarks, uh, I would like to open up the discussion for questions, as Alex mentioned. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we're going to use the question and answer feature at the bottom. Um, if you uh, just a note, if you have a specific question for one of the panelists, just please also note that so I can we can get it directed to the appropriate person. Um, let's start. There, there is a question that came in. Um, it's not directed towards anybody, but uh, it's so the, has Fenway been able to sustain revenue from patient visits throughout virtual visits or telehealth? Uh, and in the, does that include dental optometry and primary care? Anybody want to take that? Sure, I could take that. Um, yes, so we are being reimbursed for our telehealth visits um, at the same level at parity. Uh, that we, we, we would be in reimbursed for in-person visits at this point. Um, and we have a small number of dental and optometry telehealth visits that we're doing. Uh, that's an area that we've been working on with um, our, our directors in those areas, clinical directors in those areas, to continue to see how we can explore those. Uh, just to give you an example, um, our, uh, one of our dentists is conducting uh, Invisalign visits and follow-up visits. Um, uh, dental visits. So we, you know, again, we continue to see and explore uh, the many different ways that we can continue to provide care, not just in our medical and behavioral department, but in our other specialty practices as well. Great. Thanks. Um, another question. Has the number, uh, has the mix and number of gay uh, clients changed with telehealth? Are we, are we reaching different audiences? Yeah, absolutely. We're, you know, as I was mentioning and alluding to earlier, you know, we're seeing more BIPOC patients um, access our telehealth services than we did compared to our in-person services. Um, you know, we're seeing people across the country. Um, you know, we're, we looked at these data uh, by different demographics and, you know, there was some concern early on that maybe some patients uh, in um, federal poverty levels below the poverty line would have trouble accessing our services. Um, but we didn't see that. And, you know, we do think it's probably a barrier for some patients, um, but we didn't see that for a lot of our patients and they were still able to access all of our services. So, um, you know, I'm feeling very excited and very hopeful that in fact, um, telehealth isn't going to be a barrier, but it's actually gonna be, um, reduce a lot of barriers for, for people to access care. Great, and Chris, just a follow up to that. Um, you had mentioned that we are, uh, finding new patients outside of New England. Is there any data about how they are finding us? Um, great, great question, Ryan. Um, not yet at this point, but you know, um, you know, I really, Alex and I have actually talked about this a bunch and you know, we really see this as an opportunity and that makes Fenway unique that, that we can really sort of expand and explore on that. And that's part of the work that we're doing right now as part of our, um, our uh, internal groups that we're talking about ways in which we can really reach beyond um, Massachusetts. Um, you know, I can tell you that, you know, prior to COVID, when I would travel around the country and, and, and talk about um, sexual orientation and gender identity data collection, I can't tell you how many people would approach me and say, gosh, I wish there was a Fenway in my state. You know, we would really be, make all the difference in, 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 in the world for, uh, my, you know, clients and for myself and for other people. So, um, you know, Fenway, there's word of mouth out there about Fenway, um, just through the, a lot of the work that we do. But, um, you know, I think we'll be much more intentional around some of our marketing on that, too. Uh, hey, Chris, I just want to add that, you know, I'll, I would say that a fair number of the dots kind of in other states are probably our existing patients. You know, one of the things that this pandemic has done is force people for financial reasons or other reasons, right, to go back home, to move somewhere else where they might be able to afford to live. And how wonderful is it for them to not lose, right, their connection to their team nurse, to their therapist. To their primary care team, um, you know we we can keep we can keep high risk patients on their pre exposure prophylaxis medication uh, without without having them come through the door, right? We can order their STD screening at a lab close to where they live. We can send prescriptions uh, to a pharmacy close to where they live. 
Um, and we can have a telehealth visit with them um, and follow up with them, you know, via email through our portal. And so I, I'm, I share Chris's excitement about like what this means for us from, you know, a, a business model standpoint, but we haven't, I don't, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. I would say most of these people are people that we already know um, who have, have been forced, you know, by their circumstances to go elsewhere. And I'm just really excited as I hope, as I think they are, right? That they don't in the midst of a pandemic have to set up new healthcare somewhere in a, you know, in a land that they may not understand or that may not understand them like Idaho. Yeah, great. Um, Alex, there's a question that came in for you. Uh, will Fenway be partnering with other healthcare institutions to ensure all Fenway patients are able to get vaccinated? Yeah, so I want to uh, mention that Janet and Dr. Multani um, are, are, are co-leads with the vaccination effort, and they're probably drinking from a fire hose right now as far as all of the different vaccination meetings that DPH, the feds, um, and others are asking them to attend. Um, I can tell you that with respect to getting our patients the care that they need um, already, right? COVID notwithstanding, pharmacies around the country and in, in, in Massachusetts have really stepped up their efforts at uh, helping out with vaccinations. So for example, you know, we've got folks who need flu vaccines, we have folks who need shingles vaccines, um, pneumonia vaccines, and they don't all have to come to Fenway, which, you know, for many of, for many patients, who have to ride on public transportation and are scared to do so because of the high infection rates, they can just do this in their neighborhoods. So, you know, people don't often think about the retail pharmacy um, down the street as a community partner, but I think that, you know, um, that is definitely one of the partners that we will be working with. Um, we, we have our own partners within Fenway that I think we're trying to brainstorm about so our public health programs serve a very, you know, a very kind of high risk and hard to reach population. And so like thinking with the Department of Public Health, which funds our public health programs about how we can potentially integrate, you know, uh, vaccination or, you know, uh, enable other programs to uh, bring vaccination to, the, to, to our public health patients. Is an, or our public health clients is another is another idea that we're that we're looking at. I want to give Janet a chance to also chime in because I think she's been doing a lot more thinking about this than anybody else in the organization. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, I think um, we've been very lucky thus far. When um, two days ago we heard from Department of Public Health that we are receiving. Um, um, the Moderna vaccine. Um, we uh, we haven't our, our sites haven't been lumped together. So the Anson Building, the South End Building, and the Borum Building all were given their own supply um, and plenty of it. So um, we are looking at a first round for our frontline staff of about 600 doses. Um, for the first round of vaccines. We don't have to split that and, and withhold half of it for the second dose. Um, the CDC will send out the second dose at the 28 day mark. Um, so we're hopeful that the same will happen when it comes time to vaccinate our patients. Um, we have a um, grand plan on who, who will be available to vaccinate the patients and how to vaccinate the patients, our dentists. Um, the Mass Dental Society has um, given them the okay to be part of the vaccinators. The Pharmacy Society is letting pharmacists um, vaccinate patients. If we had to, our certified medical assistants can vaccinate patients. Um, so we are being very um, thoughtful about the schema of how patients are being um, phased um, and the state is helping us with that as well so that it's equitable and appropriate. Um, and we also want to do it so that we don't um, waste any vaccine because once you open a vial and each vial has 10 doses, we do, it, it's only good for six 
hours. So we want to be sure that we have 10 patients ready to go to be vaccinated with each time we open up a vial. So the 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 workflow is very complicated, but um, we have a lot of really smart people working on it. Great. Thank you, Janet. Uh, a question for Adriana. What aspects of engaging the community during COVID-19 will inform your work uh, as we after we emerge from the pandemic? I don't know. We might have lost her. All right, we'll come back to her. Um, so that actually actually ties perfectly into, I have a closing question for all the panelists. Um, as it has been inspiring to hear um, how Fenway has learned through all of this. I'm back. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Hi. And I'll say it really, really quickly. What's been so awesome about the pandemic is that we've been forced to meet people where they are. And even in moments where we may have been able to, you know, now we've been forced to meet people where we are. So now when we emerge from the pandemic, the ways we, the innovative ways we've been able to reach people, whether where they are on the acceptability of, of behavior change or improving their health or making an action to improve their health. Now we know how to connect with them in better ways. And what that takes is some institutional support to really maintain ongoing engagement. That doesn't always match up with our research time periods. And so really finding a way to keep that work going and, and being, you know, community engagement doesn't move at the pace that research does and COVID research has moved really fast. So really finding a way to maintain that and keep it going. Great, thank you. I, I just wanna be aware of the time, but I have one question that maybe every each panelist can just touch on um, quickly, very similar to what Adriana just said. Um, uh, with all the lessons that we have learned in response to the current health crisis, um, as we approach and, 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 and transform them into new approaches towards healthcare, uh, what will endure beyond the pandemic? Um, and in your mind, what gives you most hope for Fenway or just healthcare in general overall as we approach the new year? One, one of the things that I'm most hopeful about and what I think the pandemic has taught us is that none of us can do this in isolation and that we all depend on one another and we all do this as a team. And I hope that that team approach um, carries us through all of our work going forward. Great. Chris? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think, you know, it's hard, it's hard to pick one thing, I think, in particular, but, you know, there's so many other industries out there that have really um, adapted and developed a mobile strategy, and healthcare has really been kind of late to that game, and, but I think COVID really pushed uh, healthcare out of their comfort zone, and, you know, a lot, there are a lot of clinicians and people who are much more comfortable, I think, using technology now, and so, um, I'm very excited about what that holds and for a, face, a place like Fenway, uh, that's always been very innovative. You know, I think there's just so much opportunity for us. I mean, the, I think the sky's the limit in terms of what, what we can really do. Great, thank you. Alex? Yeah, so I think Anthony Fauci spoke um, at Holy Cross, which is, you know, uh, near Worcester, uh, a few months ago and he said, uh, he said, now is the time, if ever there was one, for us to care selflessly about one another. And so, you know, as much as I want to say that, you know, I'm hopeful about all, all of the things um, that, that folks have already talked about, I also want to issue a challenge to all of us. Like, we are not exempt from this challenge to continue to care selflessly about one another, no matter how cynical, you know, the, the, the world may seem and how, um, you know, how counterproductive um, some some folks' efforts might be. The only way that we're going to get through this is by continuing to help each other. And I, I would say that my Fenway experience has really allowed me to double down on that sentiment because for nine months I've seen I've seen just a very devoted crew of staff and leaders um, do just that, just be extremely selfless. Great, and rounding out, Adriana, any more to add to this, your hopes for next year? Yeah, hopes. I'm hopes. I am hopeful that we just maintain this same energy. We're all in this fight to get to where we wanna go. And I, I love the momentum and I know it's gonna continue on 
to our goals. So I'm energized and I'm excited for what's to come. Great, thank you panelists. Um, I, that concludes, um, so thank you everyone for your questions this evening. We had a, a great group of questions. Um, I, I'd like to thank Ellen and you know, Janet, Adriana, Chris and Alex for being here tonight. Um, I would also like to just take a quick moment to extend our gratitude to Fenway's frontline workers and provide providers who have been unwavering in their dedication uh, to our communities through this whole pandemic. Uh, Fenway Health has been on the front lines of innovation healthcare for nearly half a century. Uh, we're almost at the 50 mark uh, from the heights of the height of the HIV and AIDS epidemic through the current health crisis. With each new challenge, Fenway rises to the occasion, finding opportunities to ensure that healthcare is accessible inclusive and equitable for all, regardless of the patient's ability to pay. This work is vital for communities to thrive and it wouldn't be possible without the philanthropic support of our donors. If you haven't had an opportunity to make a gift to Fenway this year, I do encourage you to do so today. If you are unable to give at this time, there are ways you can support the work you've heard about tonight. If you don't currently receive our uh, care at Fenway, consider becoming a patient. We deliver the highest quality healthcare for you and your entire family. When it is safe to do so again, donate your time as a volunteer for one of our programs like Fire on Youth or attend one of our galas and events. I know I can't wait to go back to an event. And finally, join us throughout 2021 as we celebrate Fenway's, uh, Fenway Health's 50th anniversary. Uh, to learn more about all of these and other ways to support our work at Fenway, please feel free to contact anyone in the development department. And on behalf of the Board of Visitors, I want to thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Have a wonderful evening and a happy, health, healthy, and safe holiday season. Good night, everyone.